guess what I mean is, to be clear, is the dolly. Now we understand that, okay? So when they jump, the dolly no longer moves. Copy. And music. Stop. 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 On action, the dolly has to go. On the word action? back here and keep doing the washboard thing, I'll be... <laughs> oh, no, he's gone. No, we can have you slide a little closer to the lens, Adam. Okay. We're speeding. Oh, well, we'll give it a shot. We'll roll with it. All right, first of all, let's just talk about what's going on here today, because this is kind of... Luminacy, a... clearly. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that what this whole experience has been like, working with, with David and, and this group? Oh, it's or? been... Great, actually. Yeah. I mean, he's very, he's very focused and relaxed in the studio. We've had a you know, really good time working on this project. So, I mean, obviously on a shooting day, it's a bit more phonetic, but that comes with the territory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with marshalling the troops. Right. Especially to do the sort of things he's marshalling them towards. <laughs> Where'd this concept come from? Was this how much was it, were you involved in this? How much was it, David? Oh, this one's David, um, and he just sort of ran the <laughs> basics by me. Just Ooh. doing the new Village People album. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. fun to say it. That was written. Give him the beat for in the Navy. Give him the beat for the Navy. In the Navy. You can drop down on your knees in the Navy. You can give your homie head in the Navy. Come on, man, it's just <laughs> So it's that sort of lunacy, right. which is fine. You know, that you can deal with all day long and it's not a problem. How involved do you actually get to be with, with the actors and stuff like that? Because I know you've been in Hollywood circles for a long time. When, you, when you're working on a movie or working on a project, it's something you normally spend time on the set, you get to hang out with these uh, people? Not normally. You know, composers get hired after the music is shot and 
sit in a lonely, dark room for, you know, weeks in, you know, crazy solitude. And then the director comes in and waves his arms around frantically. Um, <laughs> but what I love is that there are jobs in this world that actually, you know, are like this. Right. This is the job description. <laughs> um, so no, you don't always fraternize with the talent. Right. Um, in the case of a movie like Punch Drunk Love, I did because Paul Anderson and I were working so closely on that that I was writing themes when he was working on the script and I was coming to the set and um, Adam Sandler and I would you know, work on the keyboard together. I'd find out what he could play and I'd build songs around it and uh, I had music that Paul could play on the set for actors if he wanted or for himself. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very different. But uh, for the most part, you get handed the finished film. Yeah. And you just work very, very closely with the director. You and haven't done, you've been selective, obviously, in, in what you choose to do. What, mm -hmm. what does it take for a relationship to develop with a director or for a project for you to want to go out and spend the time to put your heart and soul into a project like this? Um, it usually comes down to quality. And it can take any form. It could be emotional, intellectual, artistic. Um, I don't really have a preset notion of what kind of movie I'm interested in other than it holding my interest. Yeah. You know, that's, and that's hard enough to do. I, I don't find many things out there that are worthwhile. And, you know, Paul Anderson is just clearly a genius at what he does and if you get a call that, you know, Michelle Gondry and Charlie Kaufman are looking for you, you kind of want to see what the hell it's about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I felt with this. And when I saw the movie and saw how he was dealing with the topics in the movie, I was so smitten with it because he deals with all this heady stuff in a very plain spoken way. Yeah. You know, I think people can get nervous about what kind of movie this is because they say, oh, it's an existential comedy, what's that? And I think people's fears is, you know, akin to somebody who's a first year philosophy student in college dropping a lot of names in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, in truth, it's much more entertaining than that. And that was a big hook to me. Yeah. Besides the fact that I'm obsessed about all the same stuff David is, so sure. it made it sort of an easy, fun ride for both of us. And then how does that translate musically for you, taking all those themes in that discussion? When, when is that, how does it affect your composing? Oh, drastically. I think every conversation that's had from the first phone call to finishing the thing is an influence. Yeah. And, and I mean down to discussions about where are we going to have lunch today. And, uh, I, and I don't say that lightly. I think it all plays a part. And it plays a part in your understanding of the person you're working with. And a conversation that you have once you figure out what kind of lunch you're going to have. You know, somebody can mention a record they liked growing up. And it suddenly gives you an idea for an instrument to use or a little reference to have. And, uh, and it's great. David's, you know, really verbal guy. You know, as thoughts are coming to them, he's presenting them to you. And so there's lots of useful information to sort of, you know, chew up and spit back out in yeah. your own form. How comfortable now are you confident in the composing film world? You started as a pop guy, obviously. You've been in these circles for a while. Is this something you feel completely confident with? This, this is the... This is your, your calling in a lot of ways? Well, it's music, and I'm, I'm confident that I want to spend my life around music and creative things. I have no um, set level of confidence in my own ability, um, other than I enjoy it. You know, I like making music, and I've made enough things at this point that I have confidence that presented with something that's foreign, I'll be able to figure out my way around with a little bit of time. And that's a nice confidence to have. But I never know specifically how anything's going to turn out. Right. You know, I don't think, uh, I don't think you really can or should. I know people who do, but I don't really 
like hanging out with those people too much who are just sort of like, everything I do is great. Right. It's, uh, it's very hard to tolerate as yeah. a human. At what point were you kind of conscious of your own kind of cachet in this industry, kind of the hip factor that surrounded you and when people started talking about your name and, and your shows and it's kind of in waves and different levels. Yeah, right? see, uh, that just depends on who you ask. Yeah. You know, you could ask one person they've never heard of a thing I've done, you can ask somebody else and they're, you know, crazy about certain records but not others or people who only know me as a film composer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could ask some people who only listen to very popular records and they'll not have heard of me, but maybe know a person I've worked with. You could ask somebody who only listens to underground music that goes, oh, it's pointless even talking about him, he's too popular. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and I like that. That's not really, for me, that's not problematic. Mm -hmm. The musicians I've admired throughout my life didn't have careers that were just this constant, you know, upward motion on the graph. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, uh, just this horrible thing we have in Western society in general, but American society specifically, that you start, you gather knowledge, then you start making money, and then you start making more money, and then eventually you make so much that you stop having to do anything, right. and then you die. Um, and I grew up loving a lot of older jazz musicians, and who were already in their 70s when I was, you know, 10. And I looked at their careers and it was like this. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly they had a hugely popular band and for three years they were, you know, living on the fat of the musical lamb and then for three years couldn't get arrested, then got a gig backing up a more famous musician and mm -hmm. then, you know, rock would come along and they'd not be able to make a living here and they'd go to Paris. Yeah. And it'd be great over there. Then they'd come back here and suddenly work playing at film studios. And once enough time had passed, suddenly, you know, one of them would get rediscovered. Mm -hmm. And so my role models did what they want. They, they did what they wanted with their life. And basically, you know, the survival stuff followed suit. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of been on the same mission for years. So it doesn't really bother me what stuff is known and what stuff isn't, you know? Yeah. You know, when you're making money, when you're not. I kind of feel like a success because I survive as a musician and have, you know, my whole adult life. And I think that's nothing short of a miracle. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just super grateful. So, if anybody thinks it's interesting or hip or good or even worth their time, I'm tickled. <laughs> so. The uniqueness of actually surviving still as a musician, but also these performances, that are, you must be sent some kind of LA record at least for, for the amount of time you've been at Largo and everything else you've been doing along, along the way, mm -hmm. and then being able to compose these kinds of things. Just, just talk about maybe the joy of just still being able to perform every week and be doing these films. And well, that was, a, you know, that was a byproduct of not liking constant touring, which is what's expected of most musicians. Uh, whereas all my songwriting friends who were very well known, their favorite part was making the records. Mm -hmm. And sometimes playing a gig in a small place for very appreciative people. And at some point I just got a little sick of touring and realized that if I left town, I'd be missing creative possibilities. So when Largo came up, it just made sense. I could play 50 gigs a year mm -hmm. of my own stuff and whatever else came into my head. And the other six days a week, be working on records, doing films, playing on other people's records, producing records, working on my own. Um, and not to mention sitting in on friends' gigs when they come to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So. Really, it's been fantastic. Yeah. It's been kind of a great thing. I play more shows a year than most of my friends who tour. Yeah. How do you how do you pull that off though from week to week and, and balance everything else? And, it's okay. Um, just physically, emotionally, just from week to week. Obviously, things change, and you're, you're a different guy from week to week sometimes. But yeah, um, and you know, I guess a long time ago I chose to be okay with that. 
Um, the good thing about my live show is that there's no set list. So if I come in grumpy, I can play grumpy music for 20 minutes until the music sort of transforms my mood. Mm -hmm. And whatever mood I get into in the middle of the set, I can follow. And so, you know, somebody asked me, it's like, wow, is it, is it still interesting for you to, you know, play the same place every week and do that? I'm like, yeah, because if I get bored, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. The audiences keep showing up and they're ready to be entertained and ready to take part in something different. So they're doing their job. And I don't have a set list, so I can't say I'm bored with the material mm -hmm. because I can play whatever I want. So that's the thing that's kept it in motion for me. And mm -hmm. as my mood changes, I go with it. And I trust that the audience is going to come along for the ride. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of confidence, you know, but it's not in the quality of the individual performance. I never know how anything's going to go or any individual song is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I just know I'm going to try my hardest and I have the confidence that people are along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And it keeps working, so it's fun. Yeah. But, you know, I'm also going to go tour around the country and play some more places now. Sure. I feel like it's developed into something unique enough that I want more people to see it and know about it. Yeah. I know there was talk a long time ago of turning it into a TV show or a variety mm -hmm. thing and stuff like that. Any of those projects still in the works? Something you ever still want to There's entertain? always stuff bubbling under. Yeah. You never know which things are actually going to come to fruition. Right. Um, you know, one part that's hard is... There's so much improvisation in the show, and I don't know that you can ever have that on TV and have people believe it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's coming off a flat, two-dimensional screen, and if you see somebody on TV and the audience stand up and make a request for a song, and the performer does it, there's no reason to think that it wasn't a plant. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. can't ever believe it. Yeah. Um, Whereas if you're at the gig and your friend you came with makes a suggestion for a certain song and then somebody two tables over suggests that I play it as a death metal song and then it happens mm -hmm. on the spot, you know. You have, you have first-hand experience with it and there's so much stuff in the show that's very sort of um, tactile. Yeah. You know, has a you had to be their quality to it. Right. How much fun is this kind of performance for you when you're, you're here doing, doing your thing for, for the cameras? and The fun here is just hanging out with, you know, some friends and watching yeah. the lunacy. And, you know, you can see very spirited people. So that's fun. I mean, yeah. you know, moving your lips in time to your own voice. You know, lip syncing for yourself is really profoundly strange. Yeah. Um, I think the kind of people who enjoy that full time are just people who are power hungry black holes trying to suck the money and minds out of everyone they come in contact with and trying to, you know, be on top. Right. And that's, I don't know, I don't find it that attractive to watch and I certainly don't find that part of the experience interesting. Mm -hmm. Just the pure lip syncing thing. Yeah. yeah. I find this interesting. I find all the all the stuff David's doing, all the creative stuff, all the visual stuff, incredibly interesting. Yeah. And I'm a fan of music videos as a creative form, especially in the hands of creative people. Yeah. yeah. You know, like hell, Michelle Gondry's work is some of the best visual art on the planet, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, it's absolute stunning entertainment, and you just get that cool sense of a human brain firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so to that end, I love it. Sure. Talk about your other production work. I know people are, I'm personally waiting for the Fiona Apple album. I don't know if you can tell us about that mm -hmm. or anything else you've been working on. Uh, I think that's all just a matter of business people deciding, you know, what they're going to release and when. Um, sadly, I'm not a record company, you know. Yeah. If I was, I think there'd be a a lot of records that would have been released over the past 10 years by a lot of people I know. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully they'll get it to people soon because I think it's beautiful writing and I think she's 
one of the more formidable songwriters, yeah. period. You know, she's yeah. just great. Um, I actually met you, I think, the first time at KCRW when Tidal, when she was there. Oh, man. Doing that, because you right. were there, I think. I was playing Vibes Playing and Vibes, stuff. and I yeah. interviewed her that day, early on in her career, obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been a fan of hers ever since. Um, and what else? What stuff do you well, what, sit in? What, what other stuff are you work are you pursuing other artists at the moment? And no, I'm actually I never intended to do two movies in one year. Yeah. I always figured one every two years would probably be about right for me. Um, but I fell in love with both of these so I couldn't resist it. Um, and I'm gonna work on another record of my own. The demand was I remember the demand for your first album was years before it ever came out. I remember people were bidding for the thing and it was kinda nuts, right? Yeah, and it's because it, people well once again, I'm not a record company, you know. Uh, the record company at that time deemed it, you know, unreleasable, and and then other people thankfully begged to differ. And yeah, I know it was getting traded for crazy money for a little while there. You know, a friend of mine was like, do you know your album's on eBay? I'm like, no. He's like, do you know it's going for like 300 bucks? I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> You know, because there were a few copies that went out to press. Yeah, yeah. So there was a bit of silliness for a while, and then I just put it out myself, which was much quicker and right, just smarter. You yeah. know, I didn't have to argue with myself about the validity of the thing. So <laughs> you've, you've touched on this a little bit during some of your answers, but just, just lastly, just where you hope to see this all going for you? How far ahead do you think in terms of what you'd like to be doing down the line? Oh God, just want to be doing creative things. As long as my you know, brain will let me, and and hopefully I'll be able to keep supporting myself doing this to you know extend that miracle as far as I can. Mm -hmm. um, as long as I'm making stuff, I'll be happy. You know, that's the that's the main component that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And I really don't care what it is. Uh, you know, often I have to answer questions about. Do you prefer, you know, making your own records or producing other people? Or do you prefer live to the studio? Do you prefer soundtracks to records? And to me, these aren't different things. Mm -hmm. To me, it's all one fluid motion. You know, the only problem is that in our world, people only get to know about things if people see them repeatedly you know we see one actor doing one kind of part repeatedly and it becomes successful mm -hmm. and it's just the nature of advertising yeah and you know creative people aren't really beholden to that thank god and so to me there's no difference between working on a film with David or working with any artist I've worked with on a record. It's the same thing. It's just a collaborative thing and you try and make the most interesting thing you can. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but I find myself having to answer that question a lot. Yeah. And you know, I don't have a preference. To me, if I'm, you know, off in the corner playing acoustic guitar by myself or conducting a 50-piece orchestra or playing, you know, avant-garde noise with a bunch of friends, um, going through a music shop, whether I'm listening to music or playing it, uh, there's no difference. The gears get going and it's a delightful sensation that, you know, everybody knows. Everybody knows about the delight of music. And everybody can kind of sense that it would be a fun thing to do. <laughs> and they're right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is. So to me, it's, you know, here, there's a pile of instruments. To me, that's just, that's pure potential. Yeah. That's any, you know, infinite amount of fun to be had. And there are multiple instruments, which means multiple humans could be involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, sort of a, you know, you can't lose. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pleasure. Excellent, sir. Yeah. Into this, uh, probably won't no, work. I'm gonna stumble into it. Let's try it, guys. Not really gonna work. What? Okay. What'd you say, Jason? You have a good mark. I think it'll work. Let's go. Roll, please. You're watching the play, Nancy. I know. I'm watching the play.
Are we rolling? I mean, don't cut. I'm sorry. Mark, 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 you just sit, sit in your chair and stare out at the play like, like the bang. Okay? Come in and be in the bang. Yeah, well, you're going to wrestle in with him. Wrestle in. He'll be already there. He's not himself. Okay, let's go. Rolling. Mark. Okay. Jason, come into frame just a little more. Okay. We're rolling. Put back out right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 shit. Oh, Thank <laughs> you. 